My guest this week is probably the best known judge in the United States. And when I tell you who he is, you'll understand what I mean. His name is Judge Clifton Newman. He's a judge on the South Carolina Circuit Court, and he's the judge that presided over the recent trial and sentencing of former South Carolina attorney and now convicted murderer, Alex Murdoch. This was a trial that literally the entire nation was fixated on. And if you were watching that trial, and if you were watching the sentencing, you saw a judge in many ways in his finest moment. He received national plaudits for his calm, even-handed demeanor throughout the trial and his truly insightful comments during sentencing. Judge Clifton Newman has been a judge on the South Carolina Circuit Court for 23 years. This is not the only controversial case or even well-known case he's handled. Now, I want to make it clear to all of you listening today that there will be some things that uh, Judge Newman simply can't talk about. And if I cross that line, he'll be the first to tell me. Uh, so understand that we will be talking at some point about that trial, but we're not going to talk about it at the beginning. And here's why. I want you to get to know the man, the person uh, under that rope, uh, the person who you saw on TV, because he's a fascinating individual. I'm particularly proud because he happens to be a graduate of the law school where I am dean. He is a 1976 graduate of Cleveland State University College of Law, formerly known as Cleveland Marshall College of Law. He met his wife, Pat, as an undergraduate at Cleveland State, where he was the president of the student government. And he has quite, quite the biography. He was also valedictorian of his high school class in South Carolina. But I'd rather you hear from him about his life. So let me introduce to you now Judge Clifton Newman. Welcome, Judge. Thank you, Dean Fisher, and a uh, pleasure to be here and spend this time on your podcast. Thank you. I also will say that I'm very uh, flattered that this is the first podcast you have done uh, since the Murdoch trial, and I have no doubt that every media outlet in the country has asked you for an interview, every podcast in the country has asked you for an interview. Uh, and every law school in the country has probably asked you to speak, and yet you've chose us, and it's not because I'm special, it's because our law school's special, and that's where you graduated. So thank you for that. Uh, yeah, you're absolutely welcome. Uh, uh, certainly I have received requests from local, national, international media, requests for many interviews and podcasts, and uh, this is the first interview and first podcast that uh, I've agreed to participate in. And it's because Cleveland State has a very special place in my heart, Cleveland State Undergraduate School as well as law school. Well, let's go back even further. You were born in rural South Carolina, the first person in your family to be born in a hospital. Tell us about your childhood. Uh, well, uh, first person in my family to be built, born in a hospital, uh, prior to that time, uh, midwives delivered babies in my part of South Carolina and probably throughout the South. Uh, and a relative of ours delivered all of the babies, except for me in 1951. Um, I was born in a hospital. Uh, I was born in a born in a hospital in King Street, South Carolina, and I, I, I list King Street as my home, but I was, my home is Greeleyville, South Carolina, 13 miles away, and um, growing up in rural South Carolina was just, uh, you know, I, I have no complaints. Uh, things went well. We had a farm. Uh, we lived in town, but had a farm slightly out of town, and and we'd pack up the wagon and go and work on the farm. You went to racially segregated schools, is that right? Yes. And what was that like? All the schools uh, in South Carolina were segregated. Uh, Brown versus Board of Education was uh, came about in 1954. Um, but there was was Southern resistance 
to integration and the General Assembly in South Carolina decided to build some schools uh, to educate black children as opposed to the one-room shacks. And one of the schools built um, was a school that I attended. And I attended that school grades one through 12. And, um, but I was pleased, a loving, caring environment. I think that uh, school teachers had a very special bond with students and uh, wanted the students to excel. And, and I had a whole lot of encouragement uh, my aunts and uncles were teachers at the school. Uh, at that time, uh, if you are a black leader, so to speak, uh, you either worked as a school teacher, a preacher, or an undertaker. Hmm. And uh, there were no political leaders. Uh, so um, school teaching was a great um, profession, and I benefited from it. Now, there was a play uh, while you were in high school in which you played a role that was pretty influential in you becoming a lawyer. Tell us about that. It, it was. Uh, as I mentioned, the Brown versus Board of Education uh, was 19, the opinion was issued in 1954, um, but the original lawsuit brought to uh, desegregate, to integrate the schools, uh, that lawsuit was filed in South Carolina, in the area that I am from. And uh, Briggs v. Elliott's the name of the case. And uh, Thurgood Marshall was the lawyer who represented the families seeking uh, quality education. Uh, the presiding judge, on, uh, Wade, Jay Waiters Waring, actually presided over a case a few years before. And, and in his opinion, a dissent, he says, uh, there's no such thing as separate but equal schools. Hmm. And, and he wrote a dissent, and then he became the presiding judge on uh, on, on that particular case, and, um, and that became the majority opinion in uh, the case that was consolidated. And uh, Brown versus Topeka, Kansas board, uh, they believed that there would be more compliance with an order if it was titled Brown the board from Kansas versus Briggs v. Elliott from South Carolina. But I had the honor of playing the role of, of a lawyer. At that time, I had no shirts, ties, suits, and my grandfather bought me a, a suit, shirt, tie, black suit, yellow shirt. Uh, and while the other part players and uh, participants in the play were uh, farm people in bib overalls and dirty clothes. Uh, here I was, a dressed-up lawyer. That placed a thought in my mind that uh, stayed with me until the opportunity presented itself here at Cleveland State to pursue that goal. Was that lawyer that you were playing through Good Marshall? Uh, the lawyer was, uh, I think his name was Greenberg. He mm -hmm. was a, a lawyer, a Jewish lawyer, from New York City, who represented the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. Yes. Uh, Thurgood Marshall wasn't that lawyer. Uh, he, uh, nah, he, be, he was head of the defense fund, but he wasn't the lawyer who I played. Okay, that's fair. That's right. fair. Uh, well, so at that moment, is that the first time you actually thought, maybe I want to be a lawyer? Absolutely. Um, you know, there are no lawyers around in South Carolina that I was aware of at the time. Uh, it, it wasn't until even later in my high school years that I met a lawyer whose name was Matthew Perry, uh, and he was from 100 miles away, or mm -hmm. almost 100 miles away, and uh, he represented um, people in various lawsuits challenging uh, segregation. Uh, there's a federal courthouse now named after him. He became a, uh, a federal judge. And um, that was my only exposure to knowing someone who's a lawyer. And that was from, from afar, not even a personal encounter with him, mm. but hearing about him. That's amazing. Yeah. So I'm sure people wonder how you get from South Carolina to go to college at Cleveland State University. Explain that for us. 
Uh, well, you might have heard of the Northern, northern migration of people from South Carolina sure. to, uh, and the direct path of migration from South Carolina was pretty much up the East Coast. And my mother uh, left uh, for New York City when I was three years old to, to work and to um, help support her family, uh, leaving me with, uh, and my siblings with our grandfather and my aunt. And she worked for a family in New York City doing domestic work, the Stein family, a uh, great family. Uh, Dean, Dean Stein was uh, vice president at Columbia University. He got a job at, uh, as vice provost at Case Western, and she relocated from New York City to Cleveland with them. Hmm. Uh, and as fate would have it, his wife, Charmaine Stein, was the... Uh, close associate with the head of the Cleveland Scholarship Program, and I was offered a full scholarship to Cleveland State University undergraduate school, and that brought me to Cleveland in 1969. That's a groundbreaking program that uh, still exists to this day, uh, and I think very few people in Cleveland know that that's how you really became a judge eventually. Uh, yes, um, because the program was primarily for Cleveland area students. Um, right. But through her uh, ability to influence things uh, and the fact that my mother was a resident here of Cleveland and my official resident then became Cleveland, it, it qualified me uh, for the scholarship. Well, you're a double alum at Cleveland State. You went undergraduate and then went on to our law school. Talk about your undergraduate years. My undergraduate years at Cleveland State full of transition, uh, transitioning from being uh, uh, living in the South to living in the big city. Uh, at that time, Cleveland was the sixth largest city in the country um, and uh, had everything that anyone would look for and want in a, in a large city. And um, I, I just took the advantage of everything that I saw, uh, participated in the social organizations, uh, religious organizations, and um, worked for the Cooperative Extension Service, the 4-H clubs, uh, and just um, got great, I received great opportunities for uh, full participation in the college experience uh, through fraternal organizations, Kappa Alpha Psi, as well as uh, all other groups available for students here at that time. How is it that you came to be the president of the student government? Well, uh, there was a lot of political activism that you might imagine in 1969. That's the anti-war movement, basically, yeah, right? Yeah, the, the anti-war movement and the, uh, the there were a band of African-American students who banded together with the anti-war movement students and uh, votes coalesced and, and I came up victorious. So you're a coalition builder, huh? A coalition builder and, and of course that being a, an urban university with uh, little or no residential housing, everyone commuted. Uh, so many people did not participate. So I can't say I vote, benefited from a high voter turnout. <laughs> Well, having been in politics a long time, the key is turnout, uh, and, and it's the people who vote who make those decisions, and so you did well among those who were interested in voting for the president of the student government. Yes, sir, absolutely. Right. So you also met somebody there who, uh, who you've spent the rest of your <clears throat> life with. Tell, tell me about that. Yes, it was a cold Cleveland morning, morning in January of uh, 1970. Uh, my wife who later became my wife, was a student, and she and a group of uh, girls needed a ride home. And it was snowing, almost blizzard-like conditions. And, and I had a car, a 1963 Pontiac. And um, they asked me to give them a ride home, and, and she was one of the passengers who uh, was the last passenger uh, that I dropped off and we got to know each other. Uh, now, was that uh, intentional that you already had your <laughs> eye on her and so therefore she was the uh, last one? 
Well, you know, um, some things were in the back of my mind as we were riding home. I, I knew the other girls, so they were just, and I didn't know her. Right. And uh, she seemed so meek and mild and pleasant, and uh, and I was inter- became interested in getting to know her. Well, I've gotten to know her uh, recently, and she's uh, not meek. She's quite dynamic. <laughs> oh, oh, yes, she is. She was meek and mild at that time, but it's uh, kind of come out of her now. So when did you decide to go to law school? I decided to go to law school in, uh, I think, my junior year of undergraduate school. Um, and I had a, a friend who very much was an activist around the law, around college, uh, Frederick Hobbs, who who later became, uh, changed his name to Ishmael Jaffrey. Uh, he was a friend of mine, and uh, he was in law school. And he said, hey, why don't you apply? Why don't you try to get in law school? And that thought... I triggered was triggered back to my high school days, and uh, and I found out about the Legal Careers Opportunity Program uh, here at the law school. And uh, though I did not have the highest um, SAT scores, my GPA scores were okay, but uh, I wasn't wasn't that good on the uh, law school admissions test. But there was this admissions program that gave me an right. opportunity. And I took advantage of it. You're referring to a program that is actually groundbreaking, and we're one of the few law schools in the country that has it, even to this day. It's more than 50 years old. It's called the Legal Career Opportunities Program. And it basically is a program that says, look at the, look at the person who's applying as a whole person. Don't just judge them by a GPA or an LSAT. Look at their leadership skills. Look as to whether or not they have grit and work ethic. And some of the students who've been admitted through that program have become some of our most distinguished alumni, and there's no better example than you. Yeah, well, well, well thank you very much. And I am uh, definitely a, a beneficiary of that program and, and glad that Cleveland State had the foresight and wisdom to make uh, that opportunity available to me and, and has made that opportunity available for other students. Any war stories from your time in law school any, with any professors or your classmates? Anything that <clears throat> sort of stands out from your time there at law school? Uh, one thing stands out to me. Uh, we, I was in a class um, studying, uh, actually the class was juris, black jurisprudence or something of that nature. And uh, we were reading uh, a case in class and I noticed the name Newman versus Piggy Park. While sitting in class, I see this case, and I saw the litigant, and the litigants were uh, my my aunt, uh, and and uh, a restaurant that re- would not serve black customers. <clears throat> she filed a lawsuit against them, and and the case went to the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, she prevailed, and it set precedence for the uh, prevailing party in a civil rights lawsuit to recover attorney fees. Uh, and that case is attributed to my family, and that was just a, a high moment in law school. That is an amazing moment. <clears throat> yes. And, and I had to gleefully tell the class. Uh, those are my folks. That is a case I would never forget if I even <laughs> knew that, my, th- that you were in my class and heard that story. That's great. Uh, yes. That's great. So you graduated <clears throat> in 1976, and you begin a practice of law here in Cleveland. Uh, so I want to emphasize that a little bit before we go to the South Carolina story. Tell us about your five or six years in Cleveland before you went to uh, South Carolina. I was so pleased to become a lawyer and to finally get through with school after uh, 12 years of high school, of elementary and high school, three, four years of college, three years of law school. And now I'm finally out of law school. Uh, and not only that, uh, the intense preparation for the bar exam. I, I did not apply for any jobs. I focused on my education. And, and after taking the bar exam, I was so relieved I it didn't want to think about work or anything for hmm. for a few months and but fortunately i passed the bar exam on the first time the first time around and at the a reception here at cleveland state for the new law school admittees i met uh 
two lawyers, Elliot Ray Kelly and Thomas Gray, and uh, Mr. And they instantly said, "Oh, offered me a job. Uh, do you have a job? No. Uh, <laughs> well, you, if you want to work, uh, we have. Uh, I have an overload of work, and uh, I need you to come and help me clean it up and all that. So, my uh, I, I became a cleanup man, cleaning up a lot of his uh, past due accounts at probate court. Um, so much so that the probate court referee started appointing me to clean up other delinquent probate accounts. Huh. I received a lot of court-appointed uh, cases uh, and really was uh, was very pleased to earn the $150 that, that you could get on a court-appointed case that did not go to trial, a guilty plea or the like, and uh, became uh, a bankruptcy court trustee and received appointments from bankruptcy court and, and all of that, along with the fact that I had uh, worked at legal aid, the Legal Aid Society, while in law school, because we, we could, in the second or third year, we legal internship, legal internship right. and, mm-hmm. and I did that at Legal Aid, uh, and they referred me business afterwards. So I had a pretty good referral network to get me started. Uh, and after a year or two at Elliot Ray Kelly, I formed the law firm of uh, Belcher and Newman with uh, Michael L. Belcher, now deceased. Uh, and, and we we made, got our own firm together and got rolling and, and did quite well. So you're building this great practice out from scratch in Cleveland, but yet in 1982, you decide to go back to South Carolina. Why is that? Uh, those are rather turbulent times in education, and I had uh, uh, three children, uh, one uh, six-year-old, I guess uh, turning seven year old, years old at the time in school. Is that the one who's now a judge? Uh, no, no, okay. he, he, he's the oldest. He's a mathematician. Uh, okay, okay. Um, but he was um, part of the busing order, uh, ordering st- students to be transferred from the east side to the west side and vice versa and uh, I, we I didn't want to be a part of the busing program I had had my concerns not just uh, based on not wanting him bust to the west side but we lived in the inner city on 87th and Cedar hmm. and bought a house there um, and uh, and he'd been bullied in school for being uh a brilliant student <laughs> and so I, I said well we're not moving to the suburbs we're moving all the way back to South Carolina and uh, my wife a little with little resistance uh, agreed to for us to relocate to South Carolina I thought it would be a great place to uh, raise a family uh, however I wasn't able to convince her to relocate all the way back to Greeleyville the town of 500 people uh, but we uh, uh, relocated to Columbia, South Carolina, where I had uh, family and friends. And, of course, the rest is history because when you were in South Carolina, uh, you were a defense attorney, you were a civil practitioner, and a prosecutor, which is amazing. Most people only do one of those things. You had, in a sense, almost three different careers <clears throat> before you were a judge. Is that right? Uh, yes. Well, I started uh, defense lawyering here in Cleveland, and I'll probably say that Michael Belcher and I never lost the case. Really? We were a good guy, bad guy. I was always a good guy. He was the bad guy, but we, we got all not guilty verdicts in the cases that we tried. In fact, you won a case against uh, a guy who later became a federal <laughs> judge, a federal judge Don Nugent when he was a prosecutor. Uh, yes, and we, we have to go back and research that history. Um, uh, I'm convinced it was him, but I, I need to to verify it, but he, sure. he was a great guy, was an excellent prosecutor, great reputation, yes. and I uh, always had great respect for him. Um, and, but after relocating to South Carolina, the um, I had one or two cases, one a high-profile case locally, um, and the prosecutor uh, immediately sought to hire me to switch from defense to prosecution. I was resistant initially because I told him that I I came here to 
to help my people, to represent my people. That's why I came back home, to help my people. Hmm. Uh, he prevailed upon me that I had much more ability to help my people as a prosecutor than as a defense attorney because with the power of the pen, if I saw someone who needed help, uh, I can use with one stroke of the pen, uh, help that person a whole lot more than a defense attorney could. Was that turned out to be true? Absolutely. Uh, I, I, um, I, I consider myself a, I want to say a defense-oriented prosecutor. I mean, my goal was justice and um, never prosecuted anyone unfairly in my mind. And whomever, whoever deserved the break would get it from me. You know, I think that most people listening, even people who are lawyers, automatically assume that if you're a defense lawyer, you're representing the underdog. And if you're a prosecutor, you're going after the underdog. But that's not necessarily true. A prosecutor's got an amazing amount of power. And within that discretion, you can actually help the underdog as well. Oh, absolutely. And, um, and the prosecutor has a responsibility to uh, pursue justice, not victories. And I wasn't concerned about pursuing uh, just getting victories. My goal was to pursue, pursue justice. And justice, in many instances, uh, meant that that defendant deserved a second chance, uh, maybe even a third chance, or maybe more, depending on, on their circumstance. Well, for the rest of this podcast, we're going to talk about your remarkable judicial career that started back in the year 2000. Uh, and the way you became judge is different than the way you can become judge here in Cleveland. Explain that. Our judges are elected by the legislature at, the, at a joint session of the uh, House and Senate, and the person with the majority votes, majority vote wins. Uh, we have a merits, uh, judicial merit selection commission made up of primarily of legislators and a few citizens. Anyone can apply to be a judge who is eligible based on years of experience. And uh, you're screened out and, and, and recommended, the top three are recommended to the legis legislature for a vote. And the um, majority person with the majority wins. Uh, we're one of two states who elect judges that way. We're elected to six-year terms and have to reapply and get reelected. <clears throat> I was elected uh, to a three-year unexpired term uh, initially when the judge I replaced was elevated to the Court of Appeals, and I have been uh, re-elected without opposition uh, 2003, 2009, 2015, and 2021. So No opponents uh, ever? And, uh, no, without opposition. Ever. Boy, I wish I'd had a political <laughs> career like that. Uh, that's pretty impressive. That, and by the way, that doesn't happen by accident. People know you by <clears throat> reputation. They know that you're well-respected and well-known, and they know they can't defeat you. So they go on to try uh, in another uh, judicial vacancy or a judicial seat. Yes. Uh, so what happens now for the next 23 years is you develop this unbelievable reputation uh, as being not just a fair judge, but an insightful and brilliant judge. And as a result, you keep getting assigned very controversial cases. Uh, and one I can think of in particular that preceded the Murdoch uh, trial was the State versus Michael Slager uh, that had to do with the uh, killing, as I recall, of Walter Scott. Can you tell us about that case? It, was, it achieved national attention. Uh, yes, it was. It, it was a case uh, that came up during the uh, an initial wave of uh, police shooting cases where police officers were indicted for uh, murder, uh, which did not happen so frequently. And this was a case in Charleston, uh, South Carolina, where the where Michael uh, Slager shot Walter Scott as he was running away. A routine traffic stop. Uh, Walter Scott had an outstanding warrant for child support. Was this one of those things like the taillight is out or something? The taillight is out, according mm -hmm. to the officer. Um, it's in North Charleston, uh, not Charleston. And uh, he decided to run away. And while running away, the officer uh, pulled out his gun, gun, shot seven times, hitting him in the back six times. 
and and uh, killing him. Uh, you know the um, was he armed at all? Walter no, unarmed, unarmed. Unarmed. Shot unarmed. in the back and unarmed. Yeah, nine thirty on a Saturday morning. Uh, oh my God. Yeah, uh, the tail light. He had just he was buying this car from a friend, and in effect, he was going to buy some tail lights and various things for the car. And the officers stopped him along the way. Um, yeah, that was it was quite contentious because because the police officer was involved. And the local prosecutors and judges dealt with the uh, representing the cases brought by the police uh, officers. Uh, many of the local judges felt they had a conflict, and and uh, and I was requested <laughs> by the local judges to mm. take the case, and then appointed by the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of South Carolina to handle the case. Um, and that case had a lot of involved a lot of racial uh, undertones, uh, white police officer, black victim, uh, and uh, you know Charleston for all its progressive ways is one where there's a lot of the, the white population has exploded and the black population has decreased, mm. and, and I fought to get a balanced jury pool. Uh, which did not work in the end uh, after uh, strikes by the prosecution and defense. It left one black juror out of the entire pool, even though I had 33% um, of the jury pool who showed up for service were black. Only one made it to the jury. And uh, Why it, wouldn't have the prosecutor made sure that it was more than one? Uh, that was uh, a major concern of mine. Yeah. Um, I think their idea was that it did not matter if you were black or white as a juror. If someone was shot in the back six times, that person would be found r while running away and while being unarmed. Yes. <laughs> the race that should not and would not matter, and I think that's the way the prosecution saw it. Uh, I wish that were true. <laughs> yes. Uh, so as so as the case is progressing, and and I'm sensing this racial approach to the defense of the case, uh, and a police officer had never been convicted of uh, murdering a, a black man during that period of time or under the circumstances. Now, this is years before George Floyd. Uh, yes, yes. Um, I appointed the lone black juror as the foreperson of the jury. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm saying, well, when this verdict form is signed, if it's a not guilty verdict, he will have to sign it. Uh, and the case ended in a hung jury. They could not convict him a hung jury. Um, he was indicted for murder and also for violating um, the civil rights of, of Walter Scott. Uh, so we had parallel civil and federal charges. Uh, Slager opted to plead guilty in federal court to violating Scott's civil rights. Um, one of the arguments made by the defense lawyer doing closing argument in my case is uh, that's stuck with me is that uh, he argued to the jury do not let this judge sentence my client to prison this judge this judge that has racial overtones right there uh, well a uh, well-known lawyer who has an excellent reputation mm -hmm. representing all races but as I said, you know, defense lawyers decide what strategy they're mm -hmm. going to use. And, and that stuck with me, uh, the use of that term. And and it, it apparently registered with the jury because they it was a hung jury. <clears throat> then they decided to plead him guilty in federal court to violating uh, Flo uh, Scott's civil rights. And uh, he received a prison 20-year prison sentence. Uh, and, of course, you have issues of uh, some defendants uh, opting to do time in federal facilities rather than state facilities, right, right. as you know, and 
And that's where he's now serving time in, I believe, Colorado or someplace. In that mistrial, my recollection, <clears throat> correct me if I'm wrong, is it was just one juror. Is that right? Uh, well, it's debatable. Uh, okay. You never really know, right? You, you never really know. Yeah. Uh, one juror sent out a note saying that uh, he could not find the defendant guilty now. Um, whether he was the only juror to have that sentiment, I don't know. Um, just one sent a note, and I've changed my practices following that to not allow individual jurors to send me notes. Um, mm. that any note sent must be in writing and must be signed by the foreperson and foreperson only uh, so that we have someone speaking for the jury as yes. opposed to individual jurors. Well, before we get to the Alex Murdoch trial, there's one other case I want to ask you about, and that's, uh, I think it's called the fake Uber case. I don't really know what that means, mm -hmm. but tell us about that. Yes, uh, that case was only a, a couple of years now. Um, uh, Samantha Josephson, who was a, um, a, an undergraduate student at the University of South Carolina in a popular area of town in Columbia, uh, called for an Uber. Um, to take her home. Uh, she had been accepted into law school at Drexel University. She was from the Philadelphia area and uh, New Jer she was from New Jersey, but she she uh, applied to various law schools throughout the Northeast and was selected to attend uh, Drexel. And she was three weeks from graduation and went out with some of her friends and sorority sisters and she didn't want to stay out along with the others, so she called for an Uber. And this car pulls up, and assuming that it's an, her Uber driver, she jumps in the back seat of the car. And rather than taking her toward her housing, he went in the other direction, and she could not unlock the back door oh. because it had some type of security lock, baby lock, mm -hmm. uh, where she couldn't get out. And, uh, and she fought him fiercely. Um, she ended up being stabbed over 120 times. Oh my God. And her body discovered in an abandoned field um, the next morning. And within 24 hours, the police arrested the um, defendant who returned to the area <laughs> where the crime had occurred. Uh, his automobile soaked with blood, um, and, uh, and and I did that trial. It involved a University of South Carolina student victim and um, really caused a whole lot of security concerns around, around campus. It spawned legislation, and now um, I, I believe there may be even a congressional action uh, to place for various uh, requirements on Uber drivers to identify themselves and for people to know exactly who your type of car you're getting into. And, uh, and, and so she would have benefited from that, but the public has benefited uh, as a result of the action uh, taken by her family and others following that trial. It was just um, very tragic. And... Um, that defendant was sentenced to life imprisonment. Well, it's a tragic, tragic case, and it is frightening just to think about what she went through. Uh, but at least uh, some good came out of it because of the example of what happened to her. Public policy changed. Yes. Uh, and the world's safer, but it still doesn't lessen the horror of it. And speaking of horror, there's another trial I want to talk about, and that is in 2021, the Chief Justice of South Carolina Supreme Court appointed you to handle the criminal matters involving Alex Murdoch. I know there's certain things you can't talk about, but can you talk about what it felt like the moment you got that case and what happened after that? Yes, uh, I was a, contacted by the Chief Justice uh, during a time when the um, judiciary was under assault, and the and the bar lawyers uh, were under strict scrutiny and uh, a lot of distrust uh, because 
he had been accused or was accused and is accused of of stealing client money over eight million dollars from various clients and personal injury settlements and um, resulting in uh, about 99 indictments I believe involving him and some other people and um, I had been assigned to handle those cases uh, prior to the indictment for murder uh, he was then indicted for murder and the chief justice uh, appointed me to handle that case as well um, but having been on the bench for 23 years now I've handled many many murder cases and and I approach each one uh, about the same um, you know we have they're all tragic um, you have um, deaths you have victims uh, you have family and mourning family members and you have a defendant who proclaims innocence and uh, and we have to gear up for a trial to have the jury make a decision why do you think the world was fixated on this case in particular because as you've said you've handled many murder cases and although the Walter Scott case did a see a, a receive national attention nothing to this extent yeah and I think uh, maybe the decision to be totally transparent and allow the media to come into the courtroom and to uh, to televise every aspect of the trial right um, having encountered some resistance in the Walter Scott case and and I I um, I allowed cameras in the courtroom then but I I was more actively involved in uh, controlling what could be broadcast and what not what could not be broadcast and and, and, and having to review um, the freedom of the press and the rights of the press with regard to uh, a court and our state system is not is unlike the federal system and there's a lot of judicial discretion in what the media can and cannot uh, televise but I opted to be totally transparent uh, it's a matter of uh, great public interest within the state and, and nationally so I believe that when the case comes into the living rooms and computers and, and, and all of the uh, media sources um, it, it, it just in, caused people to be interested uh, watching justice unfold in the way that it did. Well, there's no doubt that the fact that you allowed the uh, cameras in was a big piece of this, but there's another piece too. This family was in a sense a dynasty. Uh, and I think that fascinated people as well. This was, uh, the Murdoch family goes back, I think, 100 years. In, isn't that true? Yes. In South Carolina, the uh, prosecutors are known as solicitors, and the state is, in, is divided into 16 judicial circuits, and uh, the Murdoch family were the uh, chief prosecutors in in this one circuit that includes the Hilton Head area and the lower part of the state uh, for over 100 years, from one family member down to the other, from his grandfather, great-grandfather, to Alex's grandfather, to Alex's father. And uh, it was quite surprising that it did not uh, then go down to Alex. Um, and so after having that position for all of that, those years, uh, he did not replace his father to carry on the the family legacy of mm -hmm. representing uh, the family. And um, you know, some testimony during the trial came out concerning his possible disappointment about that. Um, but there may well have been other factors uh, right. as, as well. Um, but. Yeah, it, it presented a lot of challenges as far as ensuring um, that we have a fair and impo had a fair and impartial jury, jurors who were not overly influenced about his uh, who the f defendants were. Mm -hmm. and, and South Carolina now is a, a highly uh, a state where we have a lot of new people. Um, we have. A lot of the folks on that jury pool that came in were people who had relocated from Ohio and other places. Uh, 
particularly because it includes the Charleston area. Mm -hmm. And um, so, whereas the story is a long uh, history within the state of South Carolina, many of the jurors did not know that history. Wasn't there a portrait you had to take down? Yes, uh, a portrait of his grandfather was in the hung in the courtroom, and uh, anyone coming in the courtroom would likely walk by his portrait and and <laughs> and draw the connection. Yes, um, uh, his grandfather's name was Buster Murdoch, or referred to as Buster. One Murdoch. of his sons was named Buster and, too. And one right? of the sons, yeah, uh, mm -hmm. uh, it's called Buster. Uh, sure. His name's not Buster, and, right? And his granddad's name wasn't Buster, but he was affectionately known as Buster. Yeah. And uh, it's appa quite apparent to me um, that the portrait should not of his grandfather should not be hanging there while the trial is going on of his grandson. So uh, without a motion of either party, uh, I had it taken down. Did you know Alex Murdoch before this trial? Uh, I knew Alex Murdoch, and I know Alex Murdoch. He... Uh, as a practicing lawyer, uh, and we, as circuit judges in South Carolina, we, we truly ride the circuit. I have presided in all 46 counties of the state, including the five counties within the district that his, far, his family uh, uh, controlled. And um, we, he's a well-known civil practitioner, and um, He's had many cases that uh, either I uh, presided over or had something to do with approving settlements in or, or maybe pretrial matters that resulted in settlements. He never actually tried a case before me. Um, you know, his family, uh, his, his law firm, family's law firm, uh, they were able to negotiate real good settlements. Uh, yes. Based on the scale of of Alex and the other lawyers. Mm -hmm. uh, so I would not say that I knew him on a personal level. I didn't know him to the extent that would have required me to recuse myself, sure. but, but casually I didn't know him. Well, it sounds like everybody at least knew of him, even if they didn't know him. Oh, absolutely. That's right. Uh, yeah, absolutely every judge in the state would know either know him or know of him. I want to go to the moment of sentencing because uh, there were lots of moments in that trial when you showed that you are a great judge, fair, even-handed. But during those moments, there was a personal, uh, a personal observation you made about the fact that there were almost two Alex Murdochs. And uh, can you just talk about that a little? I'm not asking you to say anything that you didn't say in court, but just talk a little bit about what you did say in court. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, after a person's found guilty, then, you know, as a judge, my role is to to be fair and impartial and to not give any indication one way or the other to a, a jury, to jurors, that of any opinion that, I'm, that I might have, and they're instructed that it is solely a matter for them to decide. But after they've made that decision, <laughs> then uh, I have before me a person who has been convicted of, of murder, of double murder, and um, and I want to give him an opportunity uh, to explain himself to me. Uh, his lawyers decided they did not want to say anything during sentencing, which is very unusual. Yeah, yeah. I had to, I reserved uh, in my mind an entire day to hear <laughs> mitigation and family members and friends and mm -hmm. colleagues to tell me what a great guy he was, or at least to try to give me the benefit of their knowledge to assist me in determining a sentence. Uh, and I gave him that opportunity because his lawyers decided not to say anything. And it's always very uh, difficult, however, when a person has been found guilty and you know that they're going to appeal the case, uh, you're, really, you're really not expecting a, a confession Right. Um, but uh, through his testimony, he uh, was an admitted drug user, and, um, and and he he said testified that when the when he called nine one one that night, he had a pocket full of opiate 
opioid pills uh, when the police came. Now, I don't know whether it's true or not, but that's what he testified to. So um, I have, I, I was building on experience that I've had on other cases over the years. Uh, I'm just not able to get defendants to recall for me the moment that they committed a murder. Hmm. Uh, and he said, well, it wasn't me. <laughs> And, uh, well, it might not have been you. It might not have been you as you stand here today. It, it might not have been you uh, that you could take yourself back to that moment. Uh, it might have been the creature that you created when you used the drugs. There had to, has to be some explanation. Mm -hmm. um, and if it wasn't you... Uh, I said it was the monster in you that you became uh, once you were hooked on the drugs or, or under the influence of the drugs. And um, that's just a thought that came to my mind. And in looking him in the eyes at that moment with really uh, you know, great empathy for him, uh, I... I he gave himself a way out by saying it wasn't me. Yes. Uh, I gave him a way out as well. Well, I guess it wasn't you. Mm -hmm. uh, it was the person you became, uh, a, another person. And I've seen it over and over again. People uh, are strung out on drugs, and it's not them. It's someone else that they, who they become uh, once they're under the influence. I was driving, listening to you talking during the sentencing, and when you made that insight, which I thought was a penetrating insight, I actually pulled over to the side of the road and just decided, I'm just going to listen to this. Because uh, I think people who listen to that uh, learn something about life, and not just about that particular case, and also the danger of drugs. And although nobody ever really knows what goes inside the, man, the mind of somebody who commits a horrendous crime. Uh, it 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 rang true for I think millions of people who said yes, good people can do bad things if they're under the influence of drugs. They can become monsters. And uh, my experience with him uh, throughout the years, he he's a great was a great person, um, very friendly, very affable, um, always enjoyed himself and enjoyed <laughs> and enjoyed life. Uh, mm -hmm. Of course. Uh, that did not include the, the, the hidden man that, that that none of us knew, and apparently uh, very few of his family and friends knew. His uh, his law firm members did not know uh, the secret life that he was living, and um, you know it just ended up being a very sad situation. Sad for him, sad for his family, um, and, and sad for the community and especially sad for the profession. You know, I'm against mandatory retirement at any age, and you're a perfect example of why I'm against it, because there's a mandatory retirement age at 72, and, and first of all, you look and act as if you're more like 52, uh, but to me, age has nothing to do with it. It's competence, and uh, I think the people of South Carolina and this nation would benefit if you were on the bench for another 20 years, but during this final year as a circuit judge, before you perhaps become a senior circuit judge and still handle cases, will you be handling more, uh, handling more cases related to the family of Murdoch? Uh, as of now, I have the remaining cases involving uh, Murdoch and many Murdoch co-defendants. Uh, you know, I'm from the state of uh, J. Strom Thurmond, who served in the Senate uh, beyond his 100th birthday. Yes. Uh, <laughs> and Senator Fritz Hollings, who has served until I, I guess he was pushing 90, which was young compared to uh, the senior senator. Uh, so it, it is a um, very difficult thing when that age limitation is placed on uh, circuit court judges and not on federal judges. Um, and, but, uh, but it has some legitimate purpose as well because uh, sure. I think... Um, you know, maybe when that retirement age was put in, the lifespan or projected lifespan wasn't what it is 
today. That's true. And I, I cannot say I'm the man, uh, I have the mental acuity that I had uh, uh, 25, 30 years ago, but, uh, but we make up for it in other ways. You know, the, the, it's called the, wisdom. The wisdom and experience <laughs> accounts for something, and, yes. and I, I try to use it all. What happens after you retire? Do you know? Uh, you know, it's sort of like uh, with lawyers. Uh, I don't know that lawyers ever retired. I haven't. I've gotten some letters from a lot of folks, and some have said they're retired lawyers, uh, but they're few and far between. Uh, I would not like to return to the practice of law, even though I have received a lot of offers uh, and inquiries from uh, firms. I've uh, uh, mediation firms, ar arbitration firms. I've been contacted by many of them. Mm -hmm. um, and there's the possibility of senior status judging in South Carolina. Um, I don't know exactly, uh, but I'm still optimistic. I'm optimistic about the future. Um, on the bench and beyond. Well, I know you teach law right now, don't you? At, was it the University of South Carolina? Yes, uh, School University of, of South Carolina School of Law. I, I teach trial advocacy, um, and, and that's a great experience, a challenging experience. And you know, I spend a lot of time talking to lawyers and scrutinizing the performance of lawyers, and and to then go from that to being in a classroom with second and third year law students and and trying to uh, teach them about the practice of law while they know uh, many in many instances they know nothing about it uh, they're just getting their feet wet into it and trying to uh, do the transition from dealing with maybe lawyers who've practiced 30 40 years to dealing with someone who's still in law school it's a it's quite a challenge but I, I truly enjoy it judge as we wind down this interview I have to ask you uh, particularly because a number of our law students in fact, not just our law students. I'm going to guess a lot of law students throughout the country are, will listen to this podcast. Any lessons learned from your remarkable legal and judicial career that just come to mind that uh, law students would benefit from? I think uh, law students need to, to understand and believe that whatever their personal makeup is, whatever their type personality they have, uh, that that's all they can can give. They they cannot become transformed and transfixed into a, a new create creature, uh, becoming a lawyer. So as long as they have confidence in themselves, um, they carry with them all the tools they need to be successful lawyers. And um, I've always banked on being sincere about what I'm doing, uh, spending the time to uh, understand what I'm doing and to uh, present myself in a manner that, uh, and I've been a trial lawyer uh, throughout my career prior to judging. I, I, when jurors see me, I want them to see someone who is speaking to them sincerely. And, um, and I think that's what many people uh, saw when I was dealing with that trial, right. um, the sincerity of dealing with the matters before me. There will be uh, books and movies made about that trial, <clears throat> and you will be a central figure, and I hope they do you justice uh, because uh, it should be a serious actor uh, who plays a serious judge who's fair, uh, even-handed, uh, even demeanored. Uh, tough when he needs to be, but compassionate also when he needs to be. And that's the kind of judge you are. We could not be more proud that you're a graduate of our law school and you have a standing offer to teach yeah. at our law school anytime <laughs> you'd like, uh, because I know our students would be uh, uh, blessed to have you in front of them well, thank you. Uh, teaching. Thank you. And so I want to thank you again for taking the time today. Uh, we're very honored that you'll also be speaking uh, to our law school later today. Uh, and this podcast uh, is, in many ways, the most important podcast I have done and maybe will ever do, given uh, what you have done as a judge. So Clifton Newman, South Carolina Circuit Judge, thank you for a remarkable career and a very, very uh, remarkable podcast today. And, and thank you for Cleveland State University College of Law. It's mean the world to me. It has meant the world to me.
which is why you'll be inducted in our Hall of Fame in 2023. I look forward to it. Great. Thank you. Thank you.